Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. In Hollywood, the land of romance and glamour, where beauty is essential to the girls and in its more rugged form is no hindrance to the men, there is one group of fellows who are different. Some of their faces look like battle terrain after Yank artillery had played a tattoo on it. And yet between them, they've, they've made... Blah, blah, blah. It's a good start. Once during the night. I gotta do that once during the night. I gotta do that once during the night. I gotta do that once during the night. Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. In Hollywood, the land of romance and glamour, where beauty is essential to the girls and in its more rugged form is no hindrance to the men, there is one group of fellows who are different. Some of their faces look like battle terrain after Yank artillery had played a tattoo on it. Yet between them, they've made millions of dollars before the movie cameras. Some are comedians, some are villains. Some are screen scalawags who have reformed, and a few have even become great lovers. Out in front by a nose is Jimmy Schnozzle Durante, who modestly points out there are millions of handsome guys, but I'm different. Jimmy's particular brand of entertainment won him a great comeback in Two Girls and a Sailor, and he followed that with little Margaret O'Brien in Music for Millions. Wallace Burry of the homely, seamy face, William Bendix, rough, tough, and with a voice to match, are two examples of where good looks didn't matter. Then there's Edward G. Robinson, who started in pictures as the personification of the evil-looking gangster. He has reformed in recent screen roles, and Humphrey Bogart also started as a gangster in pictures, and now he's making the girls swoon as a tough lover. Their faces may look like two miles of bad road, but the public loves them. Scenic backgrounds run the gamut for Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe. They include five nightclubs since the story moves through the hot spots of Manhattan following the courtship of a boy and girl in the entertainment world. The main scene is the exact reproduction of Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe, rebuilt from specifications sent by Billy Rose and from endless color photographs taken by a crew in New York. This was one of the most ambitious art directing jobs Lyle Wheeler has ever done at 20th Century Fox. Eddie Rochester Anderson of screen and radio fame returns to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer for a top featured role in For Better, For Worse. When Lois Collier reported on the naughty 90s set for some close-ups, director Yarborough insisted her natural eyelashes were too long and looked unnatural, so he had her apply light mascara. Paul Lucas, who recently co-starred with Hedy Lamarr and George Brent in RKO Radio's psychological thriller Experiment Perilous, holds the record of being hailed as a movie find more often than any other player. He was first so hailed in 1926 when he deserted the Hungarian stage and scored as Samson in Samson and Delilah. Discovered again in 1928, it was when Paramount brought him to Hollywood opposite Pola Negra in Loves of an Actress. And he has been hailed as find of the year repeatedly since, as periodically, he scored with some new and splendid performance. Paul Lucas was educated in preparatory schools and the College of Budapest. He enrolled in the Actors' Academy of Budapest and at the end of two years debuted that city's comedy in the title role of Ferenc Molnar's Lillium. He played there nine years until selected for UFA pictures by the late Max Reinhardt. Paul Lucas has been on the American screen and stage ever since 1928. He is six and one-half inches tall and weighs 186, has brown eyes, hair is distinguished gray. He's masculine, mustached a la continental and modest. His hobbies are fencing, tennis, and riding. Now a word from your local announcer. Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. James Wong Howe, one of Hollywood's most celebrated cinematographers, predicts a new era of more intimate motion pictures after the war. He speaks of intimacy, of course, from the mechanical point of view. Well, Howe says when American inventors get back to normalcy after the war, he expects to see perfect miniature motion picture cameras with which one can follow an actress all over the set, in and out of rooms and through small doors, into cars and out again, on horseback and off again, all for making for greater intimacy and finer detail. Scenes of this type are being made today, Hal says, but r rarely and awkwardly because they mean tearing an automobile apart to get the big camera inside or building a room with collapsible walls. Currently, Mr. Howe is riding a new wave of popularity, I understand, as a result of his remarkable work in Warner Brothers' jungle war drama, Objective Burma, which stars Errol Flynn and a platoon of paratroopers. Adding to the visual treats in a royal scandal are the eye-fetching costumes, tight bodiced and full-skirted, designed for Tallulah Banquet and Ann Baxter by 20th Century Fox designer, Rene Hubert. The creation of these lavish gowns was a major feat of wartime ingenuity. And Clark Gable is back again in his turtleneck sweater. 
Fifteen years ago, he introduced the garment, starting a fad that swept the country. At last, screen star Robert Walker will make a picture in civilian clothes, his first. It's metro Golden mayors new comedy, For Better, For Worse, in which he teams again with June Allison. But even in this picture, he is in G.I. garb for the first scene, and then Don Sibby's. He's been a soldier or a sailor in all his previous pictures, with the exception of Her Highness and the Bellboy. And in that, he wore a uniform, too, that of a bellhop. There are drawbacks to playing the part of a shifty, treacherous young scoundrel on the screen. One that is uh, that audiences are apt to hiss, but Dan Duryea doesn't object to little things like that, for it was his playing such a role that won him a chance at screen fame. Born in White Plains, New York, on a January 23rd, Duryea attended public schools there and Cornell University, where he succeeded Franco Tone as president of the Dramatic Society. And after graduation, he spent six years in an advertising agency. But his hankering for the stage and his friendship with the playwright Sidney Kingsley got him a role in Dead End. He was in the show for two years, the last five weeks of it in the leading role. And then he appeared in Many Mansions and Missouri Legend. His work as the traitor, Bob Ford, in the latter show brought him to the attention of Herman Schumling, then casting for The Little Foxes, Lillian Hellman's unusual drama. Duryea won the part of the thieving Leo Hubbard without any argument, played it 763 times in the New York run and 89 times on the road, and then made his screen debut in the same role in Samuel Goldwyn's film version starring Betty Davis, which gave him his long-hoped-for start at a picture career. As the crafty blackmailer in his recent film, The Women in the Window, Duryea has added more laurels to his fame. Standing an inch over six feet and weighing 155 pounds, Duryea has blonde hair and brown eyes, he is married to a non-professional and has a young son named Peter. And now a word from your local announcer. Bidwell McCormick takes you behind the scenes in Hollywood. Robert Stanton wore an Army private's uniform in his last big film role before going into the service. And he wore an Army private's uniform again for his first film role since receiving his discharge. But the uniforms were definitely not the same. His real-life military experience had streamlined him down 15 pounds to a tidy 189. Yes, when Bob came to be wardrobe for Columbia's Blonde in Brooklyn, he had to be fitted out in a new uniform, entirely different from the one he had as an enlisted man in Mr. Winkle Goes to War. That shows what army life can do. One of the most widely acclaimed serials of the year, recently published in The Woman's Home Companion and written by the popular author Thelma Straubel, has been purchased for production as a motion picture by metro golden mayor It is called You Were There and will be made with an all-star cast. Hollywood's newest Cinderella is a 16-year-old concert violinist, Camille Wicks. Until several weeks ago, Miss Wicks had never seen the inside of a motion picture studio, although she comes from nearby Long Beach, California. Camille makes her debut in the new Universal Joan Davis murder comedy, She Gets Her Man. Jim was a farmer's son and Marion a miner's daughter. Life was not too exciting in Peoria. Jim and Marion got married in their middle teens. And a week later, Jim sailed overseas to make the world safe for another generation. The bride, cowed by the inexorable turn of events, dutifully remained home with the proverbial light in the window. And then came the armistice. The happy reunion and the sobering realization, though supremely happy, they were jobless and broke. A slice of the American life typical of millions of couples of the time, but specifically the foregoing was a prologue to the careers of James and Marion Jordan, known to their radio and motion picture fans as Fibber McGee and Molly. Fibber McGee and Molly are not too far removed from their creators, Mr. and Mrs. Jim Jordan. It was love and first sight for Jim and Marion. That's the way the story goes in Peoria, Illinois, where both were born. Back from France, Jim worked as a machinist. He sold washing machines, insurance, carried the mail for Uncle Sam. Since Marion had studied voice, violin, and piano, and Jim had taken singing lessons during school vacations, they were wont to amuse their friends by holding musicales. Encouraged by friends, they formed a concert company, purchased costumes and scenery, and started out on the road. Several years of tank towns, opera houses, and vaudeville with its one-night stands and split weeks followed. And during this time, two children blessed their union, Catherine and Jim Jr. The Jordans went in for radio work in 1924, making their debut in a singing act for the magnificent sum of $10 per performance. They live on a ranch home in Encino, only a few miles from Hollywood in the San Fernando Valley, where they lead a normal family existence. Marion and Jim enjoy puttering around in the garden, movies and dining out from time to time. So it can be seen that much of the down-to-earth humanness of Fibber McGee and Molly 
is to be found in Mr. and Mrs. Jordan, their creators. Now a word from your local announcer. <laughs> 